Last month, the News Hour brought you a series of stories looking at the future of work, including a report in which economics correspondent Paul Salman explored the seeming contradiction between the fear of job loss due to the rise of driverless trucks and the current shortage of truck drivers in America. Tonight, Paul takes a closer look at the life of one of those drivers and the state of his profession. It's part of his weekly series on economics making sense. So now, when did you first start driving? 1981. You were how old? 21. And why? Why? Oh. A man whose job may or may not be threatened by technology, long haul truck driver Finn Murphy. I was at Colby College. Right. And uh, up in Maine. Waterville, Maine. And then I'd come back to Connecticut in the summers and I'd work for Callahan Brothers Moving and Storage. I took a road trip with a driver, my first ride in a big truck, and it was amazing. Over the George Washington Bridge in a big truck, down Route 13 through Delaware, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel into Virginia Beach. I had never been in the South before. I was seduced by it. I loved it. And that's when I decided I wasn't going to finish college. And so Murphy got his commercial license and his career as a truck driver and professional mover of high-priced home furnishings. He's distilled the experience into a memoir, The Long Haul, A Trucker's Tales of Life on the Road, describing an odd job for a college kid whose father was a well-known illustrator, the cartoonist behind Prince Valiant. After I told him I was leaving college after th completing three years and was going to go work for North American Van Lines, he came down and he handed me a bill for three years of college and three years of rent and said, if this is the path that you choose, then you need to pay me back for the college that you've squandered. Uh, I never did pay him, and he never did ask me again. But what drove a Colby kid from a literacy-laden family, Brother Cullen is editor-at-large of Vanity Fair, to hit the highways? It can't just be the allure of the road, I mean. Well, it was the work, too. Moving people's stuff is very fun and complicated and hard. I enjoyed the camaraderie of working with a group of men. I mean, that's how human beings lived for, you know, 100,000 years. We all lived in small societies and we all did manual labor. And we all did it with, uh, you know, our, our brothers. But there was a long period of time when you did not drive, right? Correct. So I drove for 10 years in the 80s. And then I drove, I've been driving since 2009. So another, this 10 years now. So I've had two stints of 10 years. And 20 years in between. And 20 years in between. In those two decades, he and his wife started a successful cashmere importing business, and Murphy became a city councilman in Nantucket. That life fell apart when his marriage did. So he dusted off his commercial driver's license and got back on the road. See, the, the, the thing is, when you're a long haul driver, you get to leave a whole bunch of stuff behind you. You know, when I climb up into the truck and I turn on this engine and I know I'm going to be gone for four months, I don't have to think about things. And there's a lot of guys like me out there that, you know, are running away from situations or bankruptcy or bad relationships or many things. This is a great way to be out on the lam and still get paid. Driving again and helping move people and their possessions around the country, Murphy salvaged a sense of purpose. And I was making a ton of money because all I was doing was high-end executive relocation. So I'm moving all these rich execs. How much were you making a year? How much do you make a year? Well, I, if I work 50 weeks a year, I can make a couple hundred grand. But that's the absolute high end of It's the high end of trucking. trucking. It's the high end of trucking. A furniture mover who's doing corporate relocation is going to be the high end, yeah. But what does a typical trucker make? You know, I think the average is about, you know, thirty six to $40,000 a year. And that's for a guy who's he's getting paid by the mile. He could be gone for months at a time. This isn't a you know a highly skilled or a highly paying job at all. So I you know I read The Economist every week. I'm probably the only long haul driver who reads The Economist every week. And this is a conundrum right now in today's labor market, which is yes. you know we're at 3.9 percent unemployment, but but wages are stagnant. Indeed, wages have barely kept up with inflation in the past year. For truckers, as for so many in jobs that aren't highly skilled, they've fared far worse for decades. You know, compared to what this industry paid in the 1970s, 
we're, we're way behind the eight ball because this was a solid middle class job back then, even into the 1980s. And now it's a poverty profession. And why was it so well paying back then? It was unionized and you had freight rates, you had a regulated freight market that was regulated by the federal government, just like the airlines. This all happened in the Motor Carrier Act of 1935 with FDR, because all the trucking companies were going out of business. And this is when he propped up prices. Exactly. He did it with the airlines, he did it with the trucking business, he did it with the railroads. And that's why these were middle class jobs, because you had the management and unions working together because the prices were fixed. And then that was deregulated first under Jimmy Carter, at least the airlines were. Yes. Started with Jimmy Carter and trucking and it ended, that was finished up by Ronald Reagan. But of course that means it's cheaper for the consumer, right? It was a great consumer benefit. Freight rates fell almost overnight. And this is the question. This is the question that everybody needs to ask as a citizen of any place, which is how much money do you want to save at the expense of good jobs, community character, you know, we all have our $9 sneakers from Walmart now, that's great, but in order to get those $9 sneakers, we had to export all of our manufacturing. So now we don't have good jobs, but we have $9 sneakers. Is that a good trade-off? My opinion, no. Well, a lot of Americans seem to agree with you. I mean, that is a lot of the impetus behind Donald Trump's Make America Great Again, right? It is. and. Uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be cast into the Trump camp, and I don't care who knows it, but, you know, 250 million people have been taken out of poverty in the last 30 years in the Far East and in other places, and a lot of that has to do with free trade and, and the decisions that countries like the United States have made, and I think, th I think that's great. But, you know, we need to keep our eye on the ball about, you know, our own people and you know the middle class has been hollowed out in the United States certainly in the trucking business and I'm not an expert on anything else but this is not a middle class job anymore well it's a middle class job for somebody like you it's I mean, an upper class upper, job for somebody like me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it, it's an upper class income it's still not an upper class job for the PBS news hour this is economics correspondent Paul Salman out on the road Good morning, my faithful YouTube subscribers. Today is Monday. It is the 28th of January. The year is 2019. And we just saw that report that was released by PBS. I saw it about a week ago. It talks about the trucking industry and how wages have diminished. And how you, they took a job that was once a secure middle class job and he reduced it to wages of poverty to bring cheaper comments to the, the, you know, you took out the unions, you took out deregulation, it was once a regulated industry, became deregulated, and here's the funny part about all this stuff that they do in the United States. They only do it in the United States. In other countries, Germany, Britain, other countries around the world, you're not gonna be, they didn't, the, the people who live in these countries are not allowing their jobs to be deregulated, and they're, their incomes diminished and destroyed by rich, wealthy people. Only in the United States have we been swindled into believing that lower prices mean better wages. Better lower prices, like he brought in that point, nine dollar pair of shoes. I remember as a teenager when minimum wage was being was three dollars and thirty five cents, and as they were trying to raise minimum wage, how people kept complaining that raising the minimum wage would hurt middle-class people if that this thought process has been nailed into beat into americans minds that they think that someone making more money will hurt them and their finances if something's a little bit more expensive and that thought thinking process has destroyed this country but in but in the background some very certain individuals who push this thought process have gotten extremely wealthy. By taking jobs out of the United States 
and send them to other foreign countries to make stuff for cheap. I iPhone, a thousand dollars, manufactured in China for who knows, fifty, sixty, a hundred dollars maybe. I don't think they're quite spending that much. I don't know. I, to do, I, I used to do research on what it cost to make manufacture an iPhone in China and bring it to the United States. Apple has made billions of dollars off manufacturing these MacBook products, Apple products overseas in China, like all these countries are doing. But what, well, what has it done for us here in the United States? It's done nothing but hurt us. And particularly, and if a white man is hurting, a middle-class white man is screaming that the wages are hurting, management is doing to black folks. I'm 49. We will be 49 on April 9th. I'm witnessing the effects that my nieces and nephews are having a very difficult time trying to raise children on an income less than what my father made at U.S. Steel Mill back in the 1970s. Where he was able to raise seven children, live in a nice home, drive new cars. That's not possible for a lot of even My father could read nor write. That's not happening today. If you don't have a formal education and some type of skill, a, a skill set, um, math, science, internet-based IT, you're, you, you, you're doomed. And I'm looking at my nieces and nephews who have children and other younger people, younger generation below me, and my cousins, that all of them are struggling like you wouldn't believe. Some of them have gone to school and college, get college education. It's just not working out very although they got the wrong degrees. So a lot of black folks feel like this is racially motivated. It's not. That was a white man in that report who came from a well-to-do background who chose to drive a truck because if you listen to the, if you pay attention to what he was saying, his background, his brother is the chief editor of Vanity Fair, editor-in-chief at Vanity Fair. His father was a well-educated man. He decided he wanted to do something different. Financially, he might have shot himself in the foot driving that damn truck, but he seems to be still doing, making good money. He's still making good money because he's truck driving for a wealthy, I, I can imagine, Many of the client stuff that he's moving are people he might have known all his life. So, what what is this video about? When y'all look out these streets and you look out at Black America, and you're trying to figure out what is going on in these streets, why are Black folks struggling so hard? Because the jobs don't pay nothing. When I moved to Atlanta, and it's not my first time saying this, they were paying 20 plus dollars an hour at Delta Airlines to load luggage. You were, I forget the job, uh, Porter. I don't, I don't know. Everybody was trying to get on that Delta, and it was Eastern Airlines. The, um, they were paying about 20 plus dollars an hour for you to be an employee at Delta Airlines to load the luggage under the plane. Um, I'm still a job where you just load luggage under a plane. Delta Airlines eventually ended up going through bankruptcy. And while in that bankruptcy process, they um, they reduced the wages dramatically. Now, Delta Airlines is back making billions of dollars now and very profitable. They never went back to increasing those wages, though. The wages still remain low. For certain jobs at Delta Airlines, they used to pay good money. And it ain't just Delta Airlines. I can show you many companies that have slashed wages, but now make record profits. Apple Computers is a very good example. Apple Computers stopped making stuff in the United States and shipped it overseas. That was they ended. They destroyed jobs here to send stuff overseas, and they start making billions of dollars, record record money, billions and billions of dollars. But they have not. They don't pay much in salaries, not for people outside the corporate office, that is, for Apple computers. So you have all these jobs, all these people, and it's just hurting another generation. Of, now, my nieces and nephews have went out and had all these children. I don't have any children. 
how are you going to take care of these kids? How can you feed them, house them, clothe them? How? On those meager wages. They should have went to college and got an education first, possibly a good, the right degree, right field, and then possibly they would be able to take care of their children. But they did it, they did it the way black folks do. Children first, then figure out a way to take care of them. I don't. I never understood why anyone at 16, 17, 18 years of age would want a baby to have to take care of. How, is, how can you feed and take care of the children when you can't? And as these children get older, it just turns into another catastrophe. And I'm seeing this over and over with black folks, and I'm sure it happens in white folks' land. I'm sure there's white folks out there, some 16-year-old white girl right now pregnant right now, and her boy, white, uh, whatever. But I'm seeing this a lot in our community and in my own family, and I've never understood this. I've never understood why people allow, get themselves in this position and nobody's willing to help them. You got all these right to life people. Everybody, we don't like abortion, but they're not putting any programs in place to help these young folks when they have these children. There are no jobs and opportunities for these young people to take care of these children they're having. They're not, they're not promoting um, any type of birth control programs. They want to give it a Planned Parenthood. They don't want to, they don't want to help these children, at, these people who have these children at all, but they don't want them to have an abortion. Everybody's against abortion. And you don't believe that bullshit that millions of black folks are having abortion. That is a lie straight out of motherfucking hell. I'm here to tell you that today. But again, black people have got to understand that the situations that are happening in our community is happening it's happening in every community. As these jobs, the wages get slashed and people at the very top get wealthy. In the past 20 years, the United States has created more billionaires and millionaires than any other country on planet Earth. But you got half this country living in some very bad situations. So they've strained all the money out of the, out of the working class people and gave it to these rich folks. And people just sit back, uh, you know, it's sad to me. Some people are doing very well, and some people are not doing very well. But I, as I look around Atlanta and various other cities, and I talk to people, it's a struggle everywhere, particularly for people who look like me. It's hard. It's complicated. Me and Earl, for the most part, have lived a very good life. We never had children. We never had the debt that these people have. We don't have the responsibilities. If we wanted to jump up and go to take a trip to Cancun, we could. We had the money. We didn't have to worry about who's going to take care of children and stuff. And some people want children. And I understand children are important. You know, I, trust me. But it's becoming very clear to me that average black person cannot afford to have children anymore. It just, unless they want to live in poverty. Kind of hard to get move up to middle class when white folks can't make it to middle class, and you a nigga trying to get to middle class, and you stuck in poverty having children. It ain't working. That's just my thoughts on it. My my father's great grandchildren may never be able to live as good as he lived. A man who came from Louisville, Mississippi and couldn't even read nor write. And this is in 2019. Where is that? What, what are we doing wrong here? There's something, it's, it's almost like it's a, it's like it's a bomb has been dropped on black America. Very important, like I said, I watched that report. I'm looking at this white man and he's complaining. He sees it in his own community. That's why you see so much poverty in, in our community. The jobs just don't pay nothing. The opportunities are, are just very minimal. I was telling a friend of mine um, to send his son to the military, and he didn't want to do that. I said, what are you going to do? Your son is just not that bright. He's barely making it through high school. How's he going to get through college? He won't be able to get through college. He needs a trade school. He either needs to go to the military, a job corps, or something. You can't just leave him out to run these streets in Atlanta. You got to send him someplace or else he's going to end up dead 
or worse. Bunch of children you can't take care of. Send that boy to the military. Get him through high school and get him in there. He has no criminal record, no nothing. He's clean right now. But if you put him out there on these streets and think he's going to make it, with these low-wage jobs and the possibility of having children, then and that's not going to work out. I'm all for places like Job Corps. On paper, on the surface, I know Job Corps is, is not, it's a tough place. I know the military is, is but you got to do something. You need a skill. You need to learn something. Job, they can learn heat and air, plumbing, electricity. Those are all skills that they could use Lifelong skills that can be used without the debt of a college degree. Like I said, this boy can't make, some people just can't make it through college. College ain't for everybody. There are people in college right now paying who shouldn't be there. This is the truth of the matter. Some people don't need to be there. However, I just wanted to share that video with you all. I'm going to look, get you all's thoughts and opinions about it. There was a couple other videos on PBS about the job market here in the United States. How these how these jobs have been devalued. How people's lives have been altered and changed. How middle class America has been destroyed. You all have to check it out. Um, I'd love to hear you all's thoughts and opinions on it. But it's bad out here for Black America today, and Black Amer Black America's middle class has been destroyed. And people are hurt hurting but I just wonder what is the which, how do we correct it but it's the way out without a revolution here in America and that might be the answer anyway if you like my videos click like again today this is Monday it is January 28th the year is 2019 I'm out of here enjoy your Monday I look forward to reading y'all's comments check out that video again and then let me know what you think alright I'm out bye